I'm so happy um, to be presenting to Passive House Accelerator. It is truly an honor to be here with Oka and, um, and with my team. So um, first of all, can you hear me okay? How's the sound? Doing all right? All right, great, great, great. Uh, before we get started, like I said, if you have a question, toss it in the chat. We're going to try to get to all of them before we're done. I want to start off with, uh, with who we are. So uh, we are Bright Common, an award-winning architecture practice in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, founded in 2011. And we have a simple slogan, high concept, low carbon, all people. We design buildings in this age of adaptation that we're all finding ourselves in. And that includes for us, deep energy retrofits, market rate and affordable passive housing, and mixed use multifamily projects ranging from two to so far 120 units and, uh, and beyond. And tonight we'll be showcasing a project we designed for Argo Property Group in our hometown of Philadelphia. The focus will be on more on what it's like to uh, develop and certify a project like this through a pandemic. I, I, I just wanna say, give a caveat, it's probably more at a high level to talk about this process. There'll be some focus, some detail, but it's, there's not gonna be like a lot of these deep dive hyper-focused zooms like you might normally see in construction tech. So I think we're gonna be back for hopefully a part two for, for that stuff. So lastly, um, you know, all of our work is a team effort. And I just wanna say one of the greatest pleasures of my career has been to know, uh, get to know and, and, and learn from this wonderful person, Ilke Cassidy of Holstrom System. Ilke and I have worked on many passive house projects together. Uh, including the design of their second Holstrom, Holstrom system house, which um, just received source zero certification. So I'm just really happy to be doing work with her. And um, okay, you want to just take a minute to introduce yourself? I think everybody knows you, but go for it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely some introduction here. Thank you. And uh, I can just, you know, give it back to you. It was definitely uh, awesome to work with you on, um, you know, the single family home, but also zero six. It's definitely been um, quite a journey <laughs> since the beginning. So I oh, actually yeah. had to go back very far into my archives in the in my uh, FIAS folder to um, you know dig out all my my Wolfie files and everything from the start to now. So it's definitely uh, it's it's been a journey. So uh, yeah, just to introduce myself, I'm. Um, co-founder of um, Holzram Systems. And typically when we present or we talk about, we actually talk about our process of translating um, design intent into some you know, prefabrication um, parts-based modeling and uh, you know, turning it into prefabricated panels. Um, while we do that, we always look at uh, thermal bridge free detailing and air sealing. And, um, you know, we also do passive house consulting and energy modeling. I definitely like uh, energy modeling quite a bit. And, it's so uh, good. So good. <laughs> yeah. So I was fortunate enough to work with, uh, with Jeremy on this project. And I just wanted to, uh, you know, shout out to Steve. Steve Hessler, my heart's own partner. He's right there. Hessler. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm excited to show you this project. Thanks, Ilka. Let's, let's get into it. So I wanted to start off with a little background um, to talk about we're in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the United States. And um, this is a slide from Philadelphia's Climate Action Playbook. And it just talks about what shapes Philadelphia's carbon footprint. And I think it surprises a lot of our clients. Um, this is Philadelphia's Climate Action Playbook, which is a really wonderful document. We show all of our clients and they're all always really shocked to learn that buildings and industry are 75% of our local carbon footprint. They all think it's gonna be cars and it's, uh, you know, it's transportation and waste are about 25%. So that matters, but you know, the carbon footprint of your location matters. Uh, for us in, in a dense urban city, uh, the, the buildings really matter. Um, and so all of our work as architects must respond in a meaningful way. Uh, zooming in a little bit, um, as you can see on the left is Philadelphia. Uh, my hometown, and it is a uh, it is a city of homes, uh, which includes plus or minus 400,000 attached row houses and tens of thousands of empty lots. These conditions uh, have been the proving these conditions have been a proving ground for a decade long design lab uh, decade long design laboratory for us to experiment with urban infill passive house at multiple scales and markets. 
pushing us to develop increasingly flexible and iterative strategies that can be applied to almost any site. Like if you, if you can learn how to do this stuff in a mixed human climate zone and a post-industrial city, you can kind of do it anywhere. So we, we, it's never boring. And I could say that after 10 years doing this, it is never boring. I wish it was some days. So from retrofits to fire ratings, encroachments, easements, zoning overlays, underpinning, an increasingly bureaucratic city government and all manner of unforeseen and unsavory existing conditions, it has and continues to be an evolving and invigorating landscape within which to design the future of housing. And all of that was before the pandemic. So we're also fortunate, I, I, we also design within a community and I can tell you that it's amazing to be part of a talented and supportive community of fellow Passive House designers like Ilka and many others, consultants, engineers, and, and also in this culture of people who are striving in this very DIY way to make the world a better place. Um, I, I wake up every day and, and, and I just feel like it's an amazing time to, a time and a place to live, to live and work in and to practice in. Our specific site, if you look at this map down on the right, is in a neighborhood called Allegheny West, or uh, it's also called Paradise. Um, it is the small yellow triangle. That's a, it's only a few blocks wide and it's bounded on three sides, this sort of green shape. It's bounded on three sides by three historic cemeteries. So the neighbors call it Paradise because it's kind of like being in the afterlife. <laughs> um, read into that as you will. Uh, in urban infill construction, we don't, we don't get to pick orientation or adjacent conditions, but we lucked out here as the long axis, you can see on this, this, this top right image, these are the six townhomes here, right? That face is south, that never happens. And also there's no buildings to underpin on this site, which also never happens. But our luck ran out a little bit during design as we found out very quickly that the street, uh, Lippincott Street that they face on did not have a sewer. So the developers had to foot the bill for a private sewer. So that will uh, kill your insulation budget right there. Um, all right, I'm gonna try something. Shannon, did you get my message about the countdown timer? No, I did not, Kim. Okay, cool, that worked out. Um, uh, <laughs> do you have a countdown timer on your iPhone or something like where you could, you could, you could, or just a countdown timer or whatever? Countdown right. timer, I'll find one. So one of the things when we did in the pre-call was I realized I kept using the term row houses. And if you're not from Philly, you may not want to, you don't know what a row house is. You may not know what a hoagie is. We're not gonna talk about hoagies right now. So. I kind of, I want to be a little bit more inclusive. And so I went to the trouble of preparing this presentation with, in the presentation. And so Shannon, if you could keep time for me, I'm going to attempt something I've never done before. And that is to share a brief history of the Philadelphia Row House Pecha Kucha style to do 10 slides, 20 seconds each, totaling three minutes and 20 seconds. And so um, put your seatbelt on. This is going to get a little bumpy. Let me know when you're ready, Shannon. We got to synchronize our, our thing. So I am synchronizing my clock. Uh, the I, I actually have a countdown timer to my interval timer. We're going to do this right. Five, four, three, two, one. Oops. All right. Quaker and pacifist William Penn's green country town was a revolutionary but naive idea in 1682 when he founded Philadelphia. His first land purchases quickly subdivided the sprawling lots, immediately abandoning his ideals. He did get his wide streets on a rectangular gridded plan though. Industrial capitalism demanded dense workers housing along the prosperous waterfront, proving once again that with few exceptions, the built environment is nearly always the love child of economic and political forces made with the cheapest available materials decorated in the style of its time. 118 years later in 1803, Thomas Carstairs, a feisty, no-nonsense Scottish immigrant carpenter designed and built 22 brick row houses for William Sansom, creating the first speculative housing development in the United States, what is now the South Side of Jewelers Row. Why is Philadelphia a red brick city, do you ask? And I heard you ask. Well, English settlers who survived the devastating Great Fire of London in 1666 embraced Georgian construction with shared fire resistant party walls. Plus Philadelphia sat on a high quality brick clay bed, so extensive, that after two centuries of mining has still produced more than 200 million bricks by the year 1900, adjacently spurring the patented invention of multiple brick making machines. What is a row house you are still asking from the Philadelphia Row House Manual? The Philadelphia Row House, most simply, is a one to four story, a one to four story house occupying a narrow street frontage and attached to adjacent houses on both sides. 
What are some row house types you ask? And I did hear you. There were many variations of row houses to house the rich and poor cheek by jowl at 300 square feet. The band box or Trinity was America's original tiny house with 10 foot by 10 foot floor plates. Carstairs Row is a London house plan doubling the, uh, the tiny Trinity. Wealthy Philadelphians dwelled in Georgian townhouses like this one on the bottom. By the end of the 19th century, Philadelphia had become the workshop of the world with 50 square miles of row houses and factories, in large part owing to the expansion of the humble row house, later described as a successful mix of immigration, employment, coal, real estate, and banking, it had become the quintessential object of industrial Philadelphia. In 1893, 25 million people visited the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, which included Philadelphia's full-scale display of a two-story working men's house. This exemplar for egalitarian housing stoked the desire for the American dream so much so that visitors to the exhibit wore out the floorboards, or so the legend says. With their built-in adiabatic walls, row homes make excellent candidates for passive house retrofits. Here's a diagram of a foam-free, all electric one we designed that made our clients very happy. For all the info you can handle and then some on the subject, download the free collectively authored passive row house manual from Green Building United. North Americans today predominantly live in detached single family homes with two prominent exceptions. The majority of New Yorkers live in multifamily buildings with 20 more units. And in Philadelphia, about 60% of us live in a single detached residence or what we call row homes. Does this make Philadelphia uniquely un-American or radically progressive? You decide. How'd I do? Let's hope you got any of that in. So that's the row house. Now you know what it is. I'll do a Pecha Coochie on the hoagie at the end of the thing. So, and I promise Ilka's coming up any minute. All right, let's talk about what it takes the next, uh, I, I wanna talk about next about what it takes to, to make the next generation of row housing in what we're, we're calling this new age of adaptation. So what you're seeing here is a rendering of the project we're gonna present uh, called the Zero Six. Um, it is six detached townhomes, uh, which in, in some ways they're more multifamily than multiple single families. And that is gonna come up time and time again, but in a neighborhood filled with like smaller attached homes, we didn't want it to look like a big box. Philadelphians hate multifamily housing. We hate it, including the ones I designed. After subdividing the parcel, we were able to fit um, six four-story townhomes and they each have a footprint that's 20 foot, 10 inches wide, which is really wide for a row house and 31 foot, seven inches deep, which is actually really shallow. So they're really tall, small, wide houses, if that makes sense. Uh, the home's massing is meant to nod back to traditional Philadelphia row homes, like the way Carstairs Row has these mansard roofs and, 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 and gabled roofs with dormers at, at the fourth and fifth floor, things like that, but in a modern way. So it has this three-story, what we're calling a super mansard overhanging the carport, broken up with like one and two story dormers, just to throw things off a little bit. They're clad in slate shingles on the front and painted fiber cement uh, lap siding in the rear. Um, there was really limited space for solar PV on this project, but we were, thanks to Elka's help and solar states, we were able to attain FIAS plus 2018 source zero energy pre-certification with the canopies. And more on that in a minute. And finally, finally, what you've been waiting for, Elka Cassidy. Yeah, so um, I was I was very fortunate to be um, part of this team, which was very exciting um, to look at this uh, this row of townhomes. And um, as Jeremy talked about, there it's it's kind of interesting because it's like how do you look at a building like this? Is it a single family home? Is it a multifamily? Like how do you uh, wrap your, your head around it? And I think initially we all kind of sat down and we're like, of course it's a sing single family home, right? Because it's gonna be sold individually. It's gonna be metered individually. So uh, going through passive house certification, of course we would treat them as single family homes. And that's basically how we started out with this project. And what was really interesting was that we were uh, we signed up for this uh, with FIAS for this project and uh, there was a deadline to when we needed to sign up uh, before they switched completely over from 2000 from the 2015 
uh, certification uh, goals to the 2018 and we just uh, I cut somehow I, I knew about that deadline and I was like Jeremy let's just sign up before and so that we have both choices because I didn't really know I hadn't really um, modeled anything through the 2018 um, criteria so I wasn't sure what's going to be beneficial for us or not or what the changes were so we basically started out with modeling this uh, under the um, 2015 fee certification and treating everything as a single family home so and basically we have three different uh, units one on the west side and then there are four in the middle and then one on the east side and uh, when fee is switched to the 2015 target um, or certification what they did is uh, to make everything climate specific so your targets um, you know, that were automatically generated in FIAS were climate specific at that point, which that which differentiate, differentiated them from um, from PHI at that point. So as you can see, each one of those cases has the, uh, the same targets in terms of uh, heating, cooling demand and loads. And uh, there's also a certain uh, source energy goal, I think it was a little over 6000 kilowatt hours per person per year. So I modeled each one of those units and I actually originally signed them up each one like four, six different buildings with FIAS. And then uh, we realized it's, it's kind of impossible to get there. And these, these were already modeled with very hefty um, assembly. So it wasn't just, you know, going from code or starting out with code. This was, um, I think already like our, 40 walls or something. So something pretty uh, substantial. And we realized that there's no way that we can actually get there. And as you can see, what's interesting is that each one of those models pretty, pretty differently. So the one in the in the Spheres 2015 scenario, I think the middle one actually had the maybe the most chances of actually getting certified at the end. But again, we realized this is not gonna happen. So we switched over to the 2018. Um, Is there one you want me to move forward to? Okay. Yeah, the next one. Okay, there you go. So uh, this is now switching over to the 2018. And the big change there was that it wasn't just a climate specific, but also, um, a project specific. So there's a there's a calculator online that you can uh, that determines basically your target um, targets for heating, cooling demand, and and loads. So um, and you know I have to uh, kind of input certain criteria that makes its pro projects specific, and then each of those um, scenarios basically gets a different uh, tar different targets. And for the middle one, that actually didn't work out so well. So it's really interesting because overall, you can see that your, um, your energy dem demand is the lowest on the, on the middle one, but because of how the calculator works uh, with you know, looking at the, at the envelope um, surface, it actually has way stricter target goals than the other two scenarios. So, I think we determined, I, th I think only though the one on the West actually had chances to meet certification. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we were kind of scratching our heads pretty heavily and we we're like, okay, what are we gonna do? So then we actually thought, hmm, maybe we'll just look at it. We'll scrap the whole, you know, single family home, town home idea and just look at it in terms of uh, one big block as basically a multifamily, um, uh, project and that's what we did so next slide and again I ran it through the 2015 versus the 2018 um, certification goals and uh, it turned out that the 2018 were actually uh, working out better because our targets were um, you know, calculated differently, were project specific. So with, and through all of this, these are all the same assemblies. I didn't really change any assemblies, assemblies up to that date. So uh, this is really just kind of going through how everything behaves, behaves under basically the same, um, 
circum circumstances. So um, we saw that, yeah, 2018 is going to be the way to go. And with uh, if we if you go with uh, the FIAS Plus 2018, one of the things that changed was that the source energy goals were um, were getting stricter. So if we wanted to meet source uh, or FIAS Plus 2018, we realized that we had to uh, include some PV. Yep. And then at that point, we we're like, okay, once we include some PV, we might as well go all the way out. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's that's basically that was our our marching order. <laughs> we set our our parameters, and we knew what we're gonna how we we were gonna certify and how to go about it. Um, next. And slide. it's interesting to note that mm -hmm. just so everyone knows, another thing in Philadelphia that. Well, I always try to not design houses with these fussy roof decks. They, they, but apparently you cannot sell a new construction home in Philadelphia if you do not put a roof deck that gets used three days a year. That is just the truth. You will not win with any developer, even if they agree with you, they can't sell it. And these also have garages too. We'll get into that in a minute, but you'll, you'll see that they, they kind of stand on one leg because it's more of a carport than a garage, but that's becoming a thing too. So it, yeah. And leave that alone but it, it, it when you have to put solar on it means a canopy so there's a lot of extra costs yeah so next next slide sure please um so now knowing what we gonna, we were going to do um we went ahead and um you know jeremy and, and jordan from bright common really just kind of dove into all the details and assemblies you know, together with the energy modeling, they basically created uh, all the drawings for this. And uh, at this point, I would like to just kind of talk about a little bit what it actually means to go through certification, because a lot of times these days, people, you know, a lot of people say, oh yeah, we build passive houses and uh, meaning that, yeah, they're highly insulated and lowered or tested, but they might not necessarily go through actually the certification. And I just wanted to point out how, um, um, how much value there is in actually going through certification because there is a whole nother, you know, very, very knowledgeable uh, third party that's gonna look at all your, your drawings and uh, basically prevent you from making mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there, there are certain criteria for um, assemblies that uh, are set by, by FIAS. And if you don't meet those criteria, they ask you to do a hydrothermal analysis just to make sure that everything is going to perform and well and not start molding, you know, and making sure that your indoor air quality is, is okay. So I, I feel like that's, that's a huge service for um, the developer, for yep. the architect, everyone who's responsible for this, for me, you know, I mean, I, I can look at it and say, oh yeah, it looks good, but I think it's something totally different if, if there's like, you know, these people that are so experienced really just kind of make, making sure that everything is, is good. So uh, we did have to do a couple of hydrothermal analysis, one for the for the roof and it turned out to be okay, it turned out to be safe. And then for the one for the wall assembly and when, one big reason for that was because there is um, different conditions for the, the siding or the cladding. So on the bottom there is brick and brick really holds moisture pretty well. So it was kind of important to look at, you know, does, does this all, is this all able to, to dry out accordingly? So that was that was helpful. That's something that we we went through and got a green light. Um, next slide, please. And then the other thing is thermal bridge um, analysis. So again, we uh, or Bright Common drew up these these details and we we submitted them. And then Fias looked at it and it's like, mm, you know, we're a little concerned here, we're a little concerned there. We can see that there's a, a thermal bridge there. So um, one thing is to do the the therm analysis to get the value, um, you know, to put to put into the energy model because that's something that has to be accounted for for energy purposes. And uh, I think one of them, and the longer, of course, this condition is, the more impact it has on the energy model. And we did, you know, see some changes there. So the and that's the interesting part too. Like once you dive 
deeper and deeper into the project, there are all these things that come up and, you know, the, the needle kind of swings here and there. And sometimes it's a little bit nerve wracking, right? Because <laughs> you still want to stay under that target line. But um, again, it's, it's all valuable information because besides the just the, the heat loss or the, um, you know, the thermal bridge itself, what's really in, important or accounting for it, it's really important to also look at um, uh, um, condensation risk. So because that at the end, you know, turns into um, mold and, and bad air, indoor air quality. So it's really important that someone um, really looks at this and says, okay, this is, uh, it, this is a thermal bridge, you have to account for it, but it is safe. So you can build it that way. You're not gonna encounter any kind of moisture or condensation um, accumulating at that spot. So again, very, very valuable. So we went through all of this. We basically went through a few um, review rounds and we're almost there. And then the pandemic hit. <laughs> so, uh, and basically- I mean, did it though? Did, did it happen? I don't remember anything at this uh, point. Though, I remember getting that email. That was a tough day. <laughs> Tom Hanks got it and this project, uh, that was a tough day, but hey, mm -hmm. here we are, we're still in it. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I got that email from Jeremy saying, well, I guess we're stopping this. And I was like, Jeremy, we're almost there. Oh my gosh, we were like literally <laughs> at the finish line. Yeah, know? there were just a couple of things that we just had to submit and uh, we're like, let's just go for it. Yeah. There, there are things, you know, where we could optimize this definitely. Yep. Like I think we definitely, you know, going through these rounds and adjusting and everything, we did realize at the end, you know, and there's there's a little change in the fees calculator too. Yep. That at the end, we realized, yeah, this th these assemblies are definitely uh, robuster than we need them to be. Yeah, but we can't really, you know, have. We just had. The, I felt like we were just like get that, just yeah. get it in and get that placeholder in. Yeah. We, did, we didn't. It was like ninety nine percent figured out. We knew mm -hmm. there were still things to figure out, but if we did not get that yeah. pre certification, it was never mm -hmm. going to happen ever. You know, exactly. Ever. So, it was it was done. So so we just went for it. Next slide. And we got that pre-certification for uh, source zero. So that was that was a good day. A but good we, day. we didn't know it was if you know, we didn't know how it's we did not know what it meant, but it was a very <laughs> yeah. good day. It was like it was a good yeah. news in a, in a sea of particularly confusing news at that time in human history. Yeah. Yeah. So it's back to you, Jeremy. Thanks, Elka. It was really, really fun. And uh, walked down memory lane too. It's been, we've been at this for a while. I mean, that's the thing is we, we designed this project prior to the pandemic uh, and had such a good process with Argo. They feel wonderful to work with and they're so committed to this stuff. They've you know, been working with them for years and they, they came to us, you know, designed some multifamily work uh, and, and weren't familiar with any of this stuff. And we kind of walked them through it and, and, and really, really, uh, very into it, thirsty for it, but kind of moved from just doing like making buildings all electric at first to these like just stepping up to like beefier and beefier assemblies, introducing ARVs. And then when they came across this one, like, well, do you want to go for passive house? And it was kind of like, yeah, we kind of have to. And that's that's been like the everyday is like, should we keep doing this? Yeah, we kind of have to. It's like impossible, but we have to figure it out. Like, so um, it's like this uh, really wonderful and uh, tight relationship and and to the point where sometimes I'm just yelling like no we have to and I'm just going to raise my voice to pretend that's going to make a difference so and I'm going to do all all caps texting and and pretend that makes a difference t9 predictive texting even you know anyway so one of the coolest things about Argo is is that they decided to become post-pandemic after it died it came back months months later they said you know what we're going to self-build this thing and that's the only way in hell it's ever going to happen to have a fighting chance of making this. Um, and they even became certified past house builders in the process. So just big shout out to, to David Ross and Jeremy Turr and Neil Henner and, and all the crew. They just really, they went for it because it's, uh, it's bold and every day continues to be like a real challenge. And that's the new age that like adapting within the adaptation. And we'll get to that. What you're seeing here on the left is some of the assemblies pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, right? after it got a little bit of a booster shot. Um, 
probably too soon for those jokes. We should just cut that from the recording. But um, the one on the left is like, you know, our low in body carbon wall with mostly with our, you know, most of it is our go-to plant and wood-based materials. Like we love, you know, wood fiber exterior insulation. It's like four inches out there. Two by eight, the vertical walls were able to get two by eight. This banked front wall was a little funky to deal with. Nobody knows if it's a roof or a wall to this day. And it, it, we just threw a two by 10 for now. We knew it was too much, but you know, the, there's a lower R value per inch in the wood fiber as much as we love it. And that, that can make it difficult to make these, to pass these condensation uh, sniff tests, you know? So uh, to kind of, and, and it's a little more expensive. So we had to kind of like go a little bit less on the cladding. And it's, so it's composite slate cladding out there over a WRB. And that sadly, the lesson learned after looking at like 20 manufacturers is they all require this like extra layer of plywood outside of the exterior insulation to keep it from cupping once the sun hits it. Like it's really disappointing. Um, so, you know, again, we got it in and said, we're gonna deal with this later. We know we're gonna redesign it. This wall assembly is not making total sense right now. <clears throat> so supply chain shortages and everything everyone else is dealing with has led to a redesign of the wall, which really like all made us look at this again. Like for instance, we finally got wood fiber on a project for like the third time and David went to order it and it was like, oh, it's two years out. I'm like, that's not even a lead time. That's like the time it probably takes to make a new plant, I, I would imagine, and develop a, you know, it's just insane. And mineral wool was out a year. Polyiso was like, okay, great. Let's just get the good foam. Poly Polyiso was out for like six months. You couldn't get it anywhere. EPS, I think David drove down and got it himself. Something like, there's a wild story there, but he got like the last of the EPS in the world and like stuffed it in a way. It was like hoarding insulation. That's what we were up against, right? And I know you were too, it's a tough time. So scheme number two on the right is where we're at now, three inches of EPS exterior insulation, two by eight framing for all of the exterior walls. Uh, this has a higher R value per inch slightly. Ilka can talk about this. We could have made a two by six framing. Two by six worked in the Wolfie model, but Ilka, God bless her said, you've got to have a buffer. Always have a buffer. And I said, no, I live my life fast and loose. I'm from Philly. She said, no, you have a buffer. In Germany, you have that buffer. Thank God, because it saved our asses in the end. And Ilka, Ilka can tell that story. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to uh, the changes through after the, the pandemic, because basically um, it wasn't just the wall with all the challenges that Jeremy just, um, just explained. It was also a huge switch in our window spec. Oh yeah, drove, thank you. drove a lot of this. Because um, again, as I mentioned before, like the, the building that we had pre-certified, um, we realized that we could have slimmed that down already, but we still you know, pre-certified it. We used all the best of the best uh, materials and or what, what we felt like, you know, sure. low embodied and really high performing windows and everything. And then um, we basically entered this the second round and really evaluated, okay, is what we pre-certified really what needs to be built, which we knew it's a no. So what, what can we do here? So besides the um, switch to different materials, there was also a switch to, um, to a window that was uh, slightly lower in performance. And that uh, we all know how much impact windows have in a Wolfie model. So that changed quite a bit. So um, we basically went you know, for the wall assemblies kind of went back up to two by eight um, wall, but also realized that there is, you know, the solar heat gain coefficient in windows have a pretty big impact too. So if we went with a slightly higher solar heat, heat gain coefficient, again, we would have made it uh, to, the, to, to the two by six wall. But we also were aware, and there was quite a bit of talk at that time about uh, sp specifically in multifamily homes, um, passive houses, uh, that there is a danger of overheating. So uh, we were very concerned about that because we did not want to, uh, or, you know, Jeremy and, and David did not want to build a house that is great in performance, but uncomfortable for the occupants. So we actually picked a window um, that had a lower solar heat coefficient to avoid overheating, but that meant that we actually had to go back to two by eight wall instead of yeah. two by six. So, and I'm, I'm very proud of that decision <laughs> okay. because it's, it's just yeah. going to get hotter, right? So totally. we don't want to, to just blast air conditioning um, into, into this, this home. 
Um, and the developer builder was very amenable to that. Like, you know, they, they weren't, even though the framing costs were going up and they were just, they're like, they understood the idea of a contingency, even if it was a thermal contingency, you know, it made yeah. a lot of sense to them. Yeah. So uh, then what happened is because there are so many changes, we actually had to resubmit for pre-certification. Typically, if there are smaller uh, changes, um, you know, you can basically just log it during certification, but changes like this, which is basically almost all of the specifications <laughs> for the envelope, uh, required a resubmittal. So we basically kind of started not from zero, but pretty, you know, um, you know, from the beginning. And we did not have to change any of the geometry of the building. So that was good from a Wolfie perspective because- And a zoning to, perspective, no yeah, re, yeah. no re-amendments to the for building permits or anything. Yeah. So that's, that's really good. Yeah. So it's basically figuring out doing, you know, playing the whole kind of game again with um, where, how do we get to, um, to meet certification here? And uh, what happened is that because we, so formally we had these robust um, assemblies and we were easily able to cover the solar to meet source zero that, you know, by, by switching to less robust assemblies that actually had an impact on the, on the solar canopy. So, and we weren't really sure if we can still meet the source zero. So the next round of certification, um, next slide, was actually then certified uh, as a uh, FIUS Plus project. But we knew if we are able to meet the, the requirement for the, for the PVs, that we could switch that to source zero once we get there. So, but that this was our second certification for this project. And then uh, it changed again. Changed the know. third time, third time's <laughs> a charm, friend, third time's a charm. Yeah, so because we got the news that, um, you know, things, everything got so expensive. Solar panels got COVID, they're out. You know, yeah. it turns yeah. out solar it turns out, you know, massive steel canopies, the hold of solar panels. Uh, yeah, you know, that, that came in far more expensive, you know, price of steel went up, price of labor, went, price of everything went up, everything's crazy. And it just, they came in higher than anticipated. Let's put it that way. And we needed, it's not, it wasn't just the steel, it's just everything. And we're just looking for ways to value engineer it. And I really thought again, the project was, the past cost was done. And but we were gonna save a couple hundred thousand dollars just getting rid of the solar panels and the canopies. And as much as that stinks, you know, I said, okay, well, I guess Passive House is out too, but Ilka and I talked and, and we thought about it. And, you know, there's this whole myth about like green power purchase agreements with, with Fias, where you like, if you can't put solar on, you just like purchase green power. I've never been able to figure out, nor do I know anyone who has been able to figure out how you work that out when you're selling individual market rate homes to people on spec and you're supposed to include that into a mortgage clause or something like that. It's, just, it's a myth. And so I know that it's a great idea, but that's why I think FIAS 2021 core was developed to say, just give so much more leeway. And, and like Ilka worked with FIAS, they were extremely helpful and said, do we have a green building rating system for you? We know how hard your life is. And they worked it out. And it was like music to our ears, as sad as it is to lose these things, it allows us to keep certification and offer solar panels and even the canopies as a buyer option because we had already had the the substructure installed for the canopy to attach to the like extra engineered lumber so we're like solar canopy ready as crazy as that sounds we can we can that could be a buyer option if there's pre-sales um, and i'll link those pre-sales in the chat in case you're looking to move to philly these are a deal i'm telling you these are a steal there's nothing like this in philly come and buy one i'll be your friend so uh, yeah, basically we had to do another switch to then the, the 2021 FIAS core certification, which allows us to, um, yeah, not need um, PVs or uh, yeah, solar, but only, and that's, that's what Jeremy um, kind of said before. So the, if you do the, and I didn't want to bore you with more Wolfie pictures, but basically what happens- I love those Wolfie pictures. <laughs> they're, so, they're like um, renderings made in a GeoCities <laughs> website. They're just amazing. Or like Microsoft Draw from 1993. I love them. They're great. 
Yeah, maybe I should have put them in. But anyway, so what happened once I switched over to the 2021, uh, because uh, so the, the there's another calculator, which um, calculates your targets slightly different. And I don't want to get into all the differences, nor I, I, I don't know if I could actually explain all of this. But basically, our targets uh, changed a little bit. And because we had a buffer, from the beginning, um, we were still able to meet all the heating and cooling targets and uh, basically have to, in order to not need PV to, um, you know, to, to hit that target force for source energy, um, we have to make a little change to basically be a little bit more airtight or pick appliances that are slightly more energy efficient. But under end, we have to um, provide parking spaces for um, electric. Oh, you vehicle. have to provide one EV yeah. ready parking space per yeah. unit. So if these yeah. didn't, it's so funny how this locked in. Mm -hmm. If they didn't have garages, mm -hmm. you're out, right? And so it, it is just a, which is sort of weird because I think Fias is still, and this this is just a bit of a critique on the whole thing is. The whole system, including the building code, nothing is set up for urban infill work. You know, that's just this is my big violin right now. I sort of 10, 10 more seconds, but like nobody's thinking about urban infill work and the retrofit work. You can't set up a system for that. They can't. It's it's it, you know, the whole thing is so we gotta stop thinking about single family homes as these places where you can just toss a car in the driveway. We don't have any room for that stuff in the city. And cities are dense and, and sustainable and all the infrastructure is there, but you know, so even to, to, to have the EV ready space, we're, we just got lucky because we happen to have our non urbanist garage in these things, right? But if we didn't, certification was out. So it's worth noting that. I think that should be optional, frankly. Yeah, so, well, for us, it worked out. It certainly did. <laughs> so we went from 15 to 18 to 21, and uh, here we are. And who knows, 23. Hey, let's keep going. Let's just uh, keep. Who knows? We'll Hopefully, get it done. How about we'll, that? Yeah, let's get it done. Um, thank you, Milka. Um, here's a picture of it under construction. I might toss up a, a Instagram page here in a second too, but uh, completion date, 2022. Uh, supply chain shortages uh, and, and uh, unfavorable, some unfavorable subcontractor pricing has kept us, uh, all of us on our toes. Uh, triggering ongoing design and detailing revisions to the installation, window install, cladding. By the way, with that EPS foam, we don't need, we need far less layers. So with EPS, we're looking at natural slate cladding now, which is like favorable in pricing to the plastic stuff. That was radical. We're looking at some folks in Pennsylvania and Vermont to stay regional. As long as Coupa clad from Spain doesn't just buy them all up tomorrow, they're just buying everybody up. All that aside, um, we are adapting um, within this, these forces uh, that it just feels like a meta adaptation, you know, like we're adapting within the forces while adapting to the climate crisis, right? It's been, a, um, I don't know, like a non-binary evolving circus of adaptation, like super fun, just amazing. Um, the solar canopies, uh, they're out, we talked about that. Um, green power purchase agreements, we talked about that. Um, you know, but it's just, it's just been super, super fun. Anyway, uh, let me see if I can actually bring that up because there is a better, look at that. This is more recent. This is uh, Argo's Instagram page. Woot, woot. Isn't that great? Got the, uh, there we go. A little drone, drone footage. Look how small that street is, you know. We wanted to make it a wooner for Living Street, but nobody in Philly knows how to pronounce that. So it just couldn't happen. Um, I think, uh, Oh man, how do I get uh, how do I get out of here? There we go. Figuring life out. Okay, here we are. I think we got some time for Q and A. I, that's all we have, unless Elvi want to jump in there. Um, I wanted to have a little bit of time for chit chat, and th these are project stats, and I'm not going to go over them. You can read them. Feel free to nerd out. You can ask questions about them. Um, but just the stuff at the top there is like. I'm always really proud of this, and it's always so rare when this happens, when you have a concept sketch by the brilliant Amanda Benelli, and then it gets to Ilka Cassidy. Look at that amazing Microsoft draw rendering she did. So beautiful. Uh, Wolfie model, so cool. 
and then the construction document elevation and then framing and then you know beginning to do cladding and, and waterproofing and all that and it just all looks like the same thing and that's always amazing to me when that happens because of all the things that could prevent that from all the way going through so thanks so much for your time it's been a real pleasure love this presentation and again these are one of those presentations where i invited a whole bunch of people because in vancouver we need more row homes we need more of the missing middle middle and so the fact that we have uh, a great project to showcase again stuff that's happening in philly is amazing and uh again where you guys are at with all of your uh problems challenges opportunities uh you're working through it all and it's great and uh and again great story and just so you know jeremy you finished in three minutes in 20 seconds you actually have 13 seconds in your clock so noted for future excellent stuff Thanks, um, I, I know steve has his hand up but steve you gotta wait a second because we are switching gears from our first hour to our second hour which we call overtime on construction tech nights and so we are going to dive into the questions, but if you do need to leave us, we understand, we know that, hey, we, we had an opportunity to have you for an hour, 60 minutes, and if you can stick around longer, we will dive into your questions. We will ask for you to come on if you're still around to fire uh, your lovely questions over to Ilka and Jeremy. Shannon will take care of the question concierge, and I will welcome you into the overtime. Shannon, back to you. Beautiful, Sean. Thank you so much. Our first question up is from Zoe. Zoe, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, thank you, Elka and Jeremy. Um, quite the uh, persistence here. So, uh, good job. Um, Thanks, so. My question, <laughs> my question was kind of like a two-parter on um, the Wookie analysis, not Wookie passive, but I saw a Wookie analysis that um, then was analyzed in Wookie Bio. And I was wondering, first of all, why Wookie Bio and not BTT? Granted, I haven't used Wookie Plus. I've only used like Wookie Pro. Um, so maybe that's part of it. Um, and the second part of my question, I think, was did did Theus prompt you to do that analysis? Because um, at least back when I was a couple of years ago working on um, Classified projects uh, consulting. I was only asked to do thermal bridge analyses, but not um, necessarily in, in Wookie. So those are my um, questions. Okay, so I will answer those. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was definitely requested by FIAS. So basically, um, per climate, there is a specific rule for walls and roof. Um, basically looking at uh, insulation ratio between, you know, insulation value on the outside versus inside of the sheathing. And if there is a certain, you know, I think for us, it's like 35% of insulation value needs to be on the outside. And if that isn't met, then um, fee is basically asked you to do a um, hydrothermal analysis. And um, in this case, fee is actually did it. I mean, I did a few rounds before that and I'm using um, I just you know use Wufi passive and that then switch over to the Wufi plus which looks at thermal hydrothermal analysis you know for the whole building but I still haven't figured out somehow it's different once you do it with Wufi pro and uh, I, I don't have Wufi pro so um, I let uh, FIAS do that analysis and basically what you do is you run it through Wufi pro and then you export it into Wufi bio and there it basically tells you, um, you know, there is an analysis or basically what you saw with those green lights that comes out of Wolfie Bio. And there's a second part to it where it basically um, shows you a similar graph with uh, a mold index. And I so think- I'm gonna it, have to take it up with uh, Fias themselves that they're using Bio instead of Wolfie. Yeah, I mean, it's it's actually, I mean, I use it too with just my outputs from the Wolfie, um, Wolfie Plus, you can use it, it's actually free and you just kind of download it. And it's basically just an, um, an import then into Wolfie Bio. And it's just a really nice and easy way to ana analyze, you know, your results because it's, it's a green, yellow or red traffic light. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a big fan yeah. of the green traffic light myself. Uh, 
I'm always looking for that. <laughs> and I thank you very much, Zoe, for asking that question. And I had similar ones. So our next question up is from Jim Campbell. Jim, are you still with us? Yeah, can you hear me okay though? I'm having some technical problems, okay. Yes. That's great. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I was just curious in the, the wall sections there, there was no um, air vapor retarding barrier included and just how that worked um, in terms of, or how that was possible, I guess. There is, I think it didn't show up in the diagram. Oh. Yeah, great, great question though. Yeah, we, we yeah, it's, it's the, we, we, I think when we thought about this presentation, we, we didn't want the, the super, like the actual construction document drawings are like TMI. So we made it diagrammatic and I think we, that might've just not made it in, but th there's a, there's some, there, there, there is a vapor variable layer there that's going to prevent moisture from condensing on the inside of that plywood. So okay. good, great, what, question, what, great question, great question. What did you use? So just, so it was on the inside of the stud framing, I take it? Yeah, we're not allowed to say uh, okay. brand names on this, on this call. Okay. There's um, like three in the world. So was it, it was a smart, I take it a smart uh, vapor control layer. Relatively smart. Okay. Yeah. Intelligent of some degree. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Great question, though. Great question. So just, just on that nerdy question, too, sir, then are all the uh, plugs in that layer? And so then you got to work on airtight um, plugs and switches? No, because we, you know, we, we tend to, uh, if we're doing a retrofit, which is kind of how we cut our teeth, because Philadelphia, again, 400,000 row homes, that's where you start. And, uh, we cut our teeth doing deep energy retrofits for like, you know, a dollar a square foot. It was like real fun in those days. And they're working great, you know, and they were all, you know, lots, lots, just spearheading foam free stuff, really fun stuff. Um, that we're going to do everything on the inside in terms of air tightness and vapor variable layers and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a different uh, extensive presentation we give. New construction, we're going to do that on the outside because we're pretty passionate that contractors in Philly and anywhere, frankly, but particularly Philly, there's a certain flavor. You're going to get what you get and you can't get upset. And they're, they're going to build it the way they want to build it. If it is not, if it is any more than 3% different from the building they just did yesterday, they're not going to do it. So you've really got to work hard, extra, extra hard to simplify your detailing and sequencing and materials. So they can they have a fighting chance of understanding what the hell your drawings are talking about, right? So it's just going to be on the outside, whether that's best practice or not, is arguable and probably not the topic of this podcast. But I I think it's fine. I'm not worried about it. Great question, though. Yeah, thank you for that question. And I did see the air and weather resistive barriers in scheme one and two, but. Uh... Maybe were you guys talking about outboard? No, I was talking about they were wondering how we're dealing with in, uh, inboard condensation drift. I think through you know in, in the winter months if it's going to get in you know through the cellulose and, and condense on the. Uh, okay, the got plywood. it. Thank you. Also, right. with the cellulose, I'm less worried about it too. It's it's hygroscopic, but hey, I was the one who said we're not going to do a deep dive on this stuff, so I'm going to stop <laughs> using those words. We can't help ourselves, Jeremy. I know, we really, I know. we just can't. We're addicted. Well, at some uh, point, we got to bring in the technical, the technique, and the technology. So you know, it happens in the overtime. It does. Just, just to get real Philly for a moment, too. Uh, yeah. You've never been to Wawa, friends, to your Canadian friends, and you want to come hang out. Don't go to Sheets. Don't waste your time with that garbage. Come to Wawa. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it good for right, you. We can't talk about air barrier tapes, hey. but we can definitely talk about convenience stores. Sorry, sorry, the sheets fans on the call. I'm real <laughs> sorry about that. All right, no, we're gonna no go to our sports fans next. We're gonna call out our teams. But um, who is up next? Reed Follins, another Reed. Hey, buddy. My dude. Hello, Jeremy man. Elka. Great job. Hey. It was very Thanks, man. Cool project. Tight it's street. Especially Thanks, when you make deliveries. Yes. <laughs> so Ilka, I guess in general, you mm -hmm. you ran this through Fius 15, 18, and 21. Yep. Is it getting easier? Are they like diving mm -hmm. into microclimate areas? Or it, it seems like changes. you didn't pass at 15 and 18 yeah. you were and 21 mm -hmm. you did. 
Well, it's, it's, it's changing. Like there are like subtle changes there. And uh, for us, for, for this specific uh, project, it actually worked out. I'm working on a different project where it's not necessarily like that. Ah, so that's not um, our project, is it, Oka? No. Okay, sweet. thanks. It's <laughs> great. Yeah. So, and as I said before, so I think for us the switch, and I, I, you know, I don't really know all the behind the scenes of these calculators. Right. You know, I'm I'm just using them right, <laughs> basically, right. and I know what happens, and it's really um, different from from project to project because. From my experience, I've run um, several smaller projects through 18 and then 21, and I was rushing to get them in under 18 because they would not be able to certify under 21. So it's not like a general statement, it's getting easier, definitely not. It's just, um, I don't know exactly what, what, what happens there, you know, should be a fierce session, I guess, but- um, They got, on, they got- building science geeks behind the scenes yeah. that know a whole lot more than we do on trying yeah. to figure that one out. Yeah, but so- that's good to know, good yeah, to hear. Yeah, so I can just, ex yeah, from experience. And again, I said that the heating and cooling targets, I, I forget, maybe I should have put that slide up. Um, they got stricter from 18 to right. 21 on, on this particular project, <clears throat> but we were able to meet them because we had that buffer, <laughs> right? Cool, I'm glad to hear that answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what I did appreciate though, is that you had this, um, you know, that you could kind of go through it without the PV requirements because a lot of, I mean, it's a lot of cost, right? And it's something that you might be able to do a little later. So I like the, um, you know, the chains to actually certify because you're doing so much already, right? I mean, this building, is, is far beyond code. And I think it deserves recognition <laughs> in terms of, you know, the classical certification plaque, but um, the, the solar, as Jeremy said, can be something that can be added on later. I would assume that you cannot go back to 2015 and certify something now. No. 2018, you can't? Uh, there is a deadline to, I, I don't think so. I think the deadline, has beginning of the year. I right. think everything from now, from now on. Yeah, it's that's why I was, I was okay. rushing to get a couple of projects in. So Correct. now it's all 2021. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Reed. Next up is Mr. Steve Hessler. Philly is in the house. In the house. Is Steve Philly though? JK. Hey. JK. Hey Marvel. guys. <clears throat> Very cool project. Um, great presentation, thank you. And I was lucky enough to see the building. We got a tour and it was, it was it's actually really, I really liked, I, I told Jeremy and Ilka this when we were on site. Um, it's such a cool feel inside the building because of that slant wall. I, I love the way it felt inside. I'd love to see uh, some pictures when you get some finish on there so people yeah. can see it. I've never really felt that inside a space like that, but it did something really awesome, maybe unexpected in the geometry. Um, <clears throat> but actually my question was the blue, what, what was the WRB on the outside of, of the plywood, number one? There, you I, can't, had the blue. I can't say the, um, I can't say the brand name, but it, it, <laughs> it was is blue was it and it is the outside skin, skin on the building. And it's self-adhered? It's self-adhered, yeah. And what was the perm on that? That's a, it's, I, uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I know it's, I, I do know it's far more open than I thought. Like it's not. Um, and then with the EPS, which has also got a pretty decent perm actually for foam. Yeah. You've got a, you got a vapor open assembly because you did fly. I don't with. know if it's vapor. Yeah, it's I mean, thank perm. you for that. That's generous. Is I don't it not, know if it's vapor it open. But, no. But it's definitely got to be much better than uh, a, like a zip sheathing exterior. Yeah, the blue skin, I'm sorry, the blue colored exterior skin-like membrane uh, is, is not the problem. The zip system is very closed. So we're, we're and we, we like the other ones that have little dots and and are, we like self-adhered membranes. Uh, they're really wonderful. Um, and they are, there's lots that are very open. And so uh, the, the blue... EPS, not crazy about, we're very, very obsessed about bi-directional vapor diffusion and air tightness. And so I don't think the EPS is great for that, but we couldn't buy anything else. So it was the like- EPS, The EPS is definitely quite a bit more open than any of the other foams. It, yeah, that's a good point. But you know me, 
I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to flow freely. I think it's a good insurance policy. Bidirectional vapor diffusion is, is like the best insurance policy you can buy for any construction mistakes or anything like that, where it's just like, you just, you're not going to keep water out forever. And it's, if it can dry out in any which way, but loose, that's, that's always preferable, which is why we love mineral wool and wood fiber and things like that. So when we have to do foam because we can't buy those things, EPS is our go-to. And that's usually what we like use under slabs and like under a roof, de you know, at, at the roof too, because those other ones we've used before and they just get squishy and weird. Yeah. You know? I, so I just wanted to comment because I, there was a lot of chat happening about the foam and EPS and, and then somebody had a question about the zip, like no zip question mark. So I just wanted to commend you on when, it, when you had a supply chain issue on the wood fiber and you had a cost issue. I think you, my opinion is you chose the right foam, the EPS. It does have a little bit of a perm that the other foams don't. And I think what I love is that anytime that somebody doesn't use zip as a WRB, because in my opinion, zip is not as a WRB. It's just a fail as a WRB on the outside of a building. So you ended up with plywood with a nice perm 10 to 15. Then you ended up with an actual WRB, which was the blue skin that's totally flashed and not like, you know, horizontal tape seams that are going to fail and all that. Yep. And then the EPS on the outside, I think you've got a very commendable um, assembly considering well, your Thanks, man. So, well, it's not well Holstrom, but we're pretty proud of it. It's, it's, we have no, to I think figure out these details that are like builder friendly because half the time they're going to substitute something. So we just started, we started pulling in like the framing sub to be like, listen, what are you going to buy? Yeah. And we need to talk about like, what options are you looking at at Home Depot that I can put in the drawings or something like that? That's where we're at right now is to say, I'm tired of this where you're going to like just switch it out and not tell me just what are you going to buy? And I'll tell you if it's good enough and we'll try to come to a conclusion while we're in schematic design with like the subs. We're yeah. trying to pull, you know, have those conversations and with builders who have those folks in the mix already, we have some success with that. And we, we've, it's like this balance between we want everything to be low carbon, rainbow unicorn materials. And yet we're working with people who don't understand, don't know, aren't really interested. They're not getting paid enough. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And so we are really trying to uh, find attention in those spaces and figure out a way, a way forward. And we've had success, but in other areas, it's like, you know, you, sometimes you just gotta go with the performance and, and spec and say, just, keep it as, as open as you can. These, I feel like we were able to tune it because the builder is the developer and that's that's yeah. ideal. I think you guys did a great job, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Not Our next really. question up, another Philly guy, Paul Thompson. Paul Thompson. All right, let's, let's, let's keep, we're, we're keeping it local. I'll take it easy, man. Just. just. <laughs> No, I, Don't make me look bad. Don't no, make I, me look I'm just bad. saying, you know, I, I was just looking at the picture. Thanks for, you know, the, the, the framing picture. And it just, like, there's is a lot of- there? Oh, there she, of course she is. Me. <laughs> the, um, the, there's, there's just a lot of wood, you know, and it's just a fact yeah. of building with wood and yep. um, a fact of building on site with wood and building codes and, and contractor uh, um, uh, inertia and, um, you know, knowledge and, and, and so forth. Yep. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I don't really have much to say other than uh, it would be nice to have less, less wood and more insulation. Yeah. And, um, you know, of course, that's a goal with everyone. How do we make that happen? What yep. I think is, is great, and you just talked about it, you know, with, with Steve's uh, question, which is like what the contractors can do, what they're going to do when you're working in the, the mode that, you know, your, your building is. Yeah. And, I think that one of the issues that we as the, in the past past community need to, to, uh, to address is we don't always have access right to those rainbow unicorn materials. We, we of course, we love them, right? Love them. We, we, wanna, we wanna use them. We were looking for the projects where we can use them for the clients that wanna pay for them and for you know, the, right, uh, 100%. the right situation, but that's, like you're that you're working in a down and dirty situation, which is so commendable because that's, that's a tough, it's, it, it, it's great. And you're going to get it done and you're going to do it, you know, be adding to the quality of, of life for Philadelphia in general and for the neighborhood um, in particular. Um, I, I did want to ask uh, uh, about the wood fiber. Yeah. Um, which of course we want to use in Philadelphia. I got projects I want to use in Philadelphia. 100%. Did you get a building permit showing wood fiber insulation? Uh, on the yeah. Walls? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Yeah. Okay. You Good. worried about the flame? flame yeah. Stuff? yeah. I mean, it's I four hear... stories. You know, you, you don't get into NF, NF uh, what is it? NFPA 285. I think that's the one until five stories. So right. four okay. is like big, th big, big boy three. You know, it's, it's, it still feels like that. There's some other things that get triggered. Don't get me started on building code, but it's, it's essential. It's, it's, this is type five A construction. Uh, and Amanda or Jordan uh, can tell me if I'm wrong there because I didn't draw anything on this. So uh, I did review and read mark the drawings, but uh, my, my extremely amazing, gifted and talented friends and staff that did all the work, all the real work, amazing people. Jordan Morazic, look him up online. He's actually not anywhere online. So Paul, just to address the wood thing, um, spot on. I do think one of the other parts is, you know, anything that's advanced framing gets ignored um, unless John Jensen's out on the site, like just, um, you know, breaking stones, but, um, and he's real good at that. Love that guy. But the, the, if you throw, if you throw in funky details, they're not going to get, it's a luxury, it's a luxury play, right? So we, we lost that battle too many times with the Swedish details. So it's 16 inches on center, center framing. The other thing that drove up the amount of wood on this is like, they're very tall buildings. And the way engineers engineer these is not as a multifamily building. They engineer them as if one is sitting as a sail in the wind. And that's how they have to do it by code. So a lot of the framing got beefed up in ways that I agree with you. It was like, why do we really have to do this? Um, and they don't care if you're bumping the two by eight to two by six. Their factors of safety are like, they just raise it one per year, you know? And there was also a lot of additional lumber due to the solar canopy. The steel solar canopy had to sit on a wood thing I was nuts working that out. The structural engineer, Steve Labriola, is the best in the business. I love working with that man. And, um, you know, there's things that could have, the design is complex, right? It has this canted wall. It has this, like, roof deck thing going on. There's a lot going on here. If we were to design this all over again, we all agree on the team that it would look differently. But I also think the canted wall would go away, and it would just look really boxy. So I don't regret anything, but... There's a lot of forces that pushed exactly what you're saying, um, you know. Great answer. I, I knew that that you, there was a reason. Yeah. And it was a thoughtful reason, which we always appreciate when in your projects. So and just thanks, so you know, thanks, I just, I finally got some help and I left the, um, the phone free cult and it feels good. You know, I feel like I'm back to myself again because um, I started that thing and I'm guilty of that. And I am a phone free zealot now and not a full cult member. So it feels good to have gotten some help with that. And uh, you can still be part of the cult. No, I need to, I need to, I, I'm, it's, it's, a, it's out of the binary now. We are in a new zone. I'm serious. We have to, we have to break that binary. And I'm, I don't want to use spray foam. I don't want to use rigid foam. Nothing about the belief system has changed, but I want to get some work done. And so sometimes the shit makes it into it. And what are you going to do? You, you lose sometimes. You have to compromise. So I, uh, it's like a midlife crisis. But I'm, you know, I'm Jeremy, accepting it. Don't be afraid to ask for help. I know. I, I'm <laughs> serious. This is only half joking, man. I, I really helped create that culture that really made people feel bad about doing anything wrong. And I, I, I repent publicly. And uh, hope but you know what? Good. You don't spare yourself, though. And I've got to say, I've always admired the creativity and the requirement for beauty and a deeper thought on. The form while trying to drill those details down in a way that they can be built by standard Philly subs and and anyone that's in the city knows what that means and yeah. how hard it is so and I also want to give a shout out to the framing sub on this I feel like I'm he's getting a little shape but he's actually did an amazing job this was a tough building to frame that from was just crushed it like this team there's a lot there's no room on the site there's no yeah, backyard five feet there's no room. This is a public open street that people could drive down. And these guys are crushing it out there every day in the rain. And so, you know, I don't want to make it sound like that they wouldn't do advanced framing. We just don't want to make their life hard. Their life is already hard. Their, their, their budgets are razor thin. Uh, and so we just want to make it easier, even if it means a couple more sticks of lumber. Can, can I just go back real quick and comment on the on the fire requirements on the wood fiber because we've you know looked at this 
stands up a little bit. And um, it's it's actually like there are two things. There's a flame spread, and then there's um, you know fire actually going through the assembly. And typically, wood fiber is is tested for flame spread. And it's, uh, it depends on the coating that's on there. It depends on you know the type of um, wood fiber that you're you're getting. And then, um, but the what we've encountered is that in you know your Europe, there's all the testing being done, but it's not really accepted here. Uh, so to kind of get around the you know going through the wall fire requirements, you can um, add a layer of. You know, from the it depends on what the requirements are. You can add a layer of, um, you know, gypsum board and increase that, um, you know, hourly rate from the inside and outside. Yeah, I'm not throwing shade on wood fiber. You know, I love mm -hmm. that stuff for all the right reasons. It just does. Mm -hmm. It's in the city. It's become challenging. Like when we put it out in the burbs, it's like any. It's just the go-to for everything. No, I, I know, and it's it's kind of it's just a bummer that everyone agrees that it's great material, but. You know, it's or like it's kind five, of this, multifamily. This, it can be hard too. You know, it's like it's hard to get it into these large buildings that we all want to do. And mm -hmm. and I want it to work. I really do. And we are always going to keep pushing it. Um, but it has not been easy to transfer from like small single family homes as a practice to like scale up. And I thought we had we had it here. That's what was hard. This is where it could work actually. And the yeah. and the and the and the developer said yes, I'll buy it until yeah. it wasn't available. Right. Yeah. So. yeah, I mean, the, the availability is a whole nother thing, but it just what we encountered was just um, the, the whole testing requirements, because yeah. it's it's a lot of money that this particular firm, you know, that wants to um, bring wood fiber into the United States has to pay in order to get certified. Right. It's a ton of money. So and they're not going to invest that unless they have a market. But how do you create a market if you can't really use it in certain uh, applications so it's, totally it's yeah well mark you're saying specify wood fiber even if you can't get it but you have to understand that the r it's not that easy i i agree with you but the r value you have to get these assemblies to work and this assembly was like four inches of wood fiber r value was the same as three inches of eps more or less right and so it's not a one-to-one -one switch. The wood fiber conversation, not to dive deep into it, is awesome. It is like everything except for its R value. And, and it it makes assembly, and, you, and then you have to protect it in these certain ways if you're using certain materials. So again, it's sorry, man. I, I agree with you in concept, but in practice, it just does not always follow suit. But in, we will always, that is our always our first thing to do in that mineral wool. And then if we have to, foam, you know? And I don't know if we can talk about T-studs, but that's that's the dream, brother. That's the dream. Can't wait to get there in multifamily with you. I just tossed this up here. This is flagrant advertising for our client. Come to Philly and buy a four-story, three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath townhome with EV-ready parking for like $600,000. Where? What other city in the nation or in North America can you say that that's the case? And I'm not even going to. And designed talk about by a famous architect. Look at the look at this diagram that, that Sarah Chaffee and our staff did. You know, it was so fun. My point is, is that you know, the, these are attainable homes in a way. They are not affordable housing in any way, shape, or form. We're not talking about. We do that in, in all kinds of ways and, and for other projects. These are market rate houses, but I just think that's a deal. You come over to Fishtown. You know what 600 grand buys you? like an 800 square foot fixer upper, you know? It's a true story. And, it's a true and yes, story. It, it's a stunning good deal. And we all wanna live in one of these, right? If you haven't been in one, um, I, I'm sorry that you don't know how different it feels, um, but if you have been in one, you know you wanna live in one, so. And Jeremy, don't forget to throw the uh, advertisement because, you know, again, I wanna look to see what these cost and I wanna see the floor plan, so. Oh, he did, he put it in the chat. We'll put it yeah, back okay, in. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up, but carry Throw on. it in again. Sorry, I just put it to Mary James because I don't know how to do technology. Sorry, Mary. <laughs> so I'm our bad. next question up is from Justin. Hey. Uh, great presentation. Thank you, uh, Jeremy and Elka. And actually talking about pricing and everything, I was actually wanting to know about uh, the actual budget that you guys were working with for this. I don't know how much you can actually divulge, um, but uh, and I'm sure it probably changed a lot with all these changes in the assembly types and everything. Um, and then uh, the other thing is, 
are you is a developer seeing any more interest in selling these because they are uh, you know PS certified or you know passive us? Great questions. Uh, that there is some interest in uh, selling them because they're passive house. It would, for, as from an architect standpoint, I can tell you that in the last two years, last three years or so, we've gotten a lot more requests for passive house, um, including this one, to say, yeah, we we would they even know what those words are, things like that. Um, and so there there is a there is, I I mean there's a market for this. I believe there's a market for this. Uh, we're designing two more that are like almost. They're very similar in scale and scope in a different neighborhood that probably has a higher out sale. And those clients we worked with before came back and said, we have to do passive house. I mean, it's like music to my ears and they can tell you why they have to do it. They can tell you uh, from a head, you know, a head perspective, a heart perspective and a gut perspective. They can, they can make these arguments in this like cogent way that is astounding and music to my ears. Makes me wanna um, keep being an architect, you know? In terms of the, the price per square foot, uh, I'm not, I don't know exactly. Honestly, I would tell you if I did know, and what I can tell you is that it changes every week and it's not going, it's like, it is going like this and the trend is not going down because part, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a level of chaos in the system right now that I'm tired of people saying supply chain issues. No one even really knows exactly what that means. It's, it's, it's like a, who know what do we what do we mean and and subcon I just think people are feeling chaotic and I know that there are real problems you, if you can't get the wood you can't get the wood but no one can exactly explain why you can't get certain things because we're in this like complicated global system of again supply chains right so I don't know is the answer um, I I could tell you what we thought we used to be able to do it for but that doesn't mean anything anymore so thank you sorry man. No, it, it's it's fine. And as far as the, the supply, like the issues, I mean, we're having a project right now where it's like we have a contractor who's like just buying uh, a rock wall installation without us finishing the the PHP across for this project and to really figure out if that's the right amount. So it's like everything's back. Yeah, it's, that, it's like a purchase and hoard thing. Crazy. Yeah, but everyone's facing the same stuff, you know. Yeah. I hope it works out for you. I do. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that question, Justin. And our next one is from Stephen in Boston. Stephen, are you still with us? You wanna unmute and ask your question? Or I can ask it for you if you don't have the unmuting capability. So Stephen asked, isn't the plywood sheathing more restrictive than the EPS? Hey Shannon, I'm here. Oh, excellent, Stephen, I was hoping. <laughs> Mr. Bazek. So, yeah, I mean, I was just, the, the discussion, uh, was it Holt, was his name Holtstrom, was bringing up about uh, permeability. Um, the uh, EPS is certainly, uh, has some vapor open nature to it, but wasn't it over plywood? Yes, sir. The plywood sheathing on the building. So the most restrictive part of the building assembly is going to be the plywood so the permeability of the self-adhered building paper or the eps foam really doesn't play that much of a role in drying potential to the outside if you're using plywood or osb as as, as far as i know plywood is, is pretty open it's actually I think plywood's pretty open right yeah it's, that's it's... maybe like a half a perm more maybe a no. more than osb no no it's pretty OSB open. Is all no 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 Plywood's 10 to 15. OSB's three to five. Yeah. Yeah. Must be all those little pieces and all that glue. But but Steve, it's a, it's a good point. Um, is this Steve Basic? Yeah. Long time listener, big uh -huh. fan. Thank you. Thanks for keeping I guess, it real. I guess my point though is, you know, we worry about vapor. I hear this argument all the time about where vapor comes from and the big old bad vapor monster. Um, you know, it's uh, when, when we're dealing with walls, did, did, I didn't catch, did you have a ventilation system in this building? Yeah, there's um, compact air treatment units by a certain French Canadian. Uh, I can't say, I'm not allowed to from name From Montreal, the maybe? Yeah. Yeah. He's, He's a, a wonderful human and they're, they're really wonderful units and there's He's two there's two uh, two for 
unit. It's a bit of a magic box. I wish I could name it, but uh, um, yeah, it's a really wonderful, um, really wonderful. You really have to plan out. The ductwork is larger, so it was a challenge to really think about how these things snake around more than just like a, a you know four inch. It's, ductwork a, it's a great project, and it's but it's one of those things where I think I would place an exponential value on a rain screen before I word about yeah, good word. versus plywood or something like that. That's a good word. I think that I spent too much of the last first five years doing passive house, just freaked about, about what you call the vapor monster because we were doing a lot of retrofits. So there was, there was some dab, there was some real like coming at that, but uh, at my FIAS training in 20, what was it, 2015 or something, um, you know, they're just kind of like, you're worried too much about this um, and you focus on bulk water, which we were doing obviously, and we had the green screens really locked in too. So I was able to kind of like come off the anxiety trip on, on the vapor monster. We, we wanna care about it. We really should care about it, but I don't, I, I, uh, I think, I think uh, Dr. Joe said, you know, your vapor barrier, something like this, I'll paraphrase like, but your vapor barrier is just, it's handling vapor, it needs to be good enough. If you're using an interior air barrier, that's a different thing, but it's not an air barrier. So like, get it up there, if there's some holes in it, it's fine. I mean, it was a very kind of like, it's, it's handling most of it. And if you have a good, insulation that's going to especially dense pack spread that out there's really nothing that, there's not much to worry about i don't i don't i don't uh stand yeah, I, mean, well, I, I, I tend to agree but with Il, Il, this is where ilka just schools me and uh i just always feel really i feel smarter and dumber at the same time and i well, always agree with her so just wait for it i think we need to worry about it but i don't think it's it, you, the conversations that i hear usually that surround vapors is treating it like it's this big old bad monster yeah totally and and it's really not as bad as it seems like I, i've seen water intrusion investigations far exceed any vapor problems i mean you mean like of, bulk water from the outside Steve, yeah i mean the yeah. amount of um building investigations that we've ever done with vapor is is minuscule to yeah you know everything else but it seems like we really really worry about that and and the drying potential and all of this stuff and they're, they're, yeah, they're all right, really man. cool big words to throw around and they drive some really cool details but i think one of the most important things about your presentation is is the fact that if we're ever going to make a change we have to make buildings that people can build and build easily and build yep. fundamentally financial Right. And from sticks that you get down the street at the local lumber yard. Yeah. I, mean, we, we, I am all about the most whiz bang panelized technology. I love Holtzrum. Huge fan. But the other side of my brain also says we got to make it accessible to not not just like I think there's a lot of folks in Philly. There's really wonderful stories, wonderful programs of like training, just as an example, at risk youth who like, you know, uh, youth build Philly, training kids to do this work. And to get them into the field, to get them into the trades and just like knowing a trade where you're like part of an airtighting crew that like taping these membranes is like a really radical climate activism moment. We're like framing in a way, like Paul said, that makes more sense to use less wood or like, you know, like you're saying, but these are things that are not um, completely just telling decades of tradespersons that they're just doing everything wrong. You know, there's a lot that is being done wrong. We all know what that critique is, but I'm pretty passionate. Have it. I was a builder for about 10 years and uh, realized after 10, I'm just not physically built for it, you know, a, 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 for a lifetime. But these guys are out there every day and women are out there every day. And they they deserve a lot of respect for just being out in the, in the elements all day trying to figure this shit out. So I want to make their life easier and for them to not hate me and my half-assed drawings, you know, sorry, Jordan, these are amazing. I'm talking about the ones that I used to do, yeah, but no, you want it to make sense, you know, they are directions for building. Architects are graphic designers. We're not builders. We just make two-dimensional things, you know, that's it. I don't know. There's some digital twins out there that beg to differ when you plug them into the robots. I know, and buildings come but out. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a bit of a Luddite. That's why I like hanging out with Stephen Oka. You know because... I, I gotta jump in here. I gotta jump in because um, I'm going to call out two Philly people that I love because we're just so Philly centric tonight. And one is Tim McDonald. When he first started building Tim passive houses Boston. affordably North at Shore, market Boston. rate, so. he was only vapor open in one direction. He was not bi-directional. And we all had this big debate. You know, everybody in Philly was talking about 
oh, well, aren't you worried about it going one way? And, you know, he's like, look, it's drying out. That's, that's what I need to worry about because I need to be able to afford to build it. Yep. And so it's a great conversation to have. Are you going to be bi-directionally vapor diffuse? Are you going to be monodirectional? You know, and why? And do you have the data to prove your claims? Are you doing a model? Do you feel like you need to? Because if you're not building airtight, if you're not meeting passive house air tightness, maybe you've got enough infiltration to do some drying out for you. But, uh, you know, I get the fear of God put into me when I know Laura Blau is out there testifying on jobs that are rotting in four years because they are built wrong and they are built tight and they are growing mold. So, you know, when you get rushed to the emergency room because your house is making you sick, you beg to differ. But Can I, sorry. Yeah, go for it. Can I comment too? <laughs> I've been waiting. So I totally agree that the bulk water is the first thing to take care of. I think we all agree with that. And I feel like, you know, in the passive house world, um, that's somewhat of a, of a given by now that there has to be a rain screen. So I, I think that's kind of vapor versus uh, bulk water. I mean, bulk water wins, definitely. But I, I do think that we have to be very, very conscious of the vapor um, and understand that the tighter the buildings get, especially with code changes and everything we do have to to understand the building building science behind it because it can go very very wrong because vapor can uh, cause quite a bit of uh, mold growth and really bad indoor air quality if you don't understand what you're getting into and um, I know that I'm, I'm originally from from Germany and the whole you know energy efficiency and everything kind of took off a little earlier and um, you know there's quite a bit uh, kind of a bad rap even for passive house because people just started building you know, just airtight and, and putting insulation in and there were problems. So I think just kind of fundamentally, um, you know, once you start building tight, just what Shannon said, you have to understand what you're doing. And I think, um, you know, just going back to, to Jeremy's project, the, the key there was, uh, although this was not super vapor open because of the EPS, there's a certain amount of exterior insulation versus interior insulation that goes back to the FIAS requirements and why they require those, um, those hydrothermal models just to avoid, um, you know, condensation and mold growth. And as long as you keep those ratios, you should be safe in those, those climates. I mean, they're con conservative, um, you know, consciously conservative. If you don't meet them, do a hydrothermal analysis, which of course is not, you know, the answer to everything. Um, but, you know, just kind of knowing about this. And then once you, you move over to like a vapor open building, then it's totally different because then you actually have the opportunity to dry out. So you don't nearly necessarily have to meet those, um, those ratios because you have other, other opportunities there. So I just wanted to throw that in. What's that, Elka? Hey, Thanks, I, Elka. I, I'll just finish up, Shannon, if you, if you don't mind. Yeah, Stephen, please. So. I mean, I, I, I hear you. One of, the, one of the things that I always tell people when, when we're talking is the ability to dry out um, is only justified if you have the ability to get wet, right? So it's, it's a rate question, as Joe would say, um, and Peter. And so that we worry about the ability to dry out when we should really worry about the ability to get wet first, right? So that if we if we could take care of that, then I don't think there's the issue of the 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 issue of drying out lessens significantly if I can solve the problem of getting wet. Absolutely, I mean, bulk Steve, water first. <laughs> at the same time, yeah, bulk, yeah, bulk water all day. But like the very first architect, I was like 21 years old. He was like, you know, water always finds a way. So. It always wins. It's just a matter of time, and it comes in all directions and, and from below too. We're not even talking about foundation upwicking. You know, there's just so many, and I think that's bulk water too. So, I agree with you. Um, but none of those, none of the guys I learned from were talking about vapor at all. So to me, it was like a revelation, and I think I got obsessed with it. And then I care about it, but I think it's it is relative. But again, when I mean, you're talking about deep energy retrofits in 1800s buildings. You better damn well care about vapor because it is is going to cause all kinds of problems in your structure in climate zone 
we're in 4A, especially if you're in 5, you're going to have all kinds of problems. So that's where my kind of obsession was with it. And I've kind of come off of that a little bit. So thanks for your comments. Really helpful, as always. Absolutely. Thank you, Stephen, for starting that debate, because it's a great one to have. And I think it was Joe who also said if someone discuss, invented wood, yeah, they would be shot. <laughs> oh, you don't want me to debate, especially Boston or Philly. Mm. Yeah, Red Sox, Phillies. <laughs> Canadians in the room. Right, wait, get I'm going to hand it over to Mark Willie really, because he's been so patiently waiting. Mm -mm. Yeah, let's not talk about sports because I'm from Chicago, so I, I don't want to clean house that quick. Uh, I'm so sorry for your loss, by the way, Mark. You. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry for your loss. Pre, just pre sorry. I'm pre sorry for your loss. I'm sorry. Still then. Sorry, My you're really busy. busy. Uh, so, a question that is just for fun. Love you, brother. A question that's just for fun is, what's what's in the water in Philly? I mean, the, what an amazing continued group uh, out of there. The people coming, the people going, the people there. I think it's amazing. It's got to be the water. So please bottle it. No, don't bottle it. Please share it. Anyway, um, well, I, I just want to... Do you know that like our, do you know who our mascot is for the Philadelphia Flyers? Do you know about Gritty? Oh my gosh, Gritty. Like just so you know what's in the water, this is who we, this is a design like mascot for a, a National Hockey League team. If you want to check it out, I don't know how to put a, an image in there, but it's a really wonderful place. It's a unique place that has a lot of cultural forces in it. And it's a, it's got a huge DIY spirit, but we are so proud just who we are that we are going to make like a zombie looking insane lidless mon lid eye lidless eyed monster that gets close to children i have seen this thing in person it's terrifying so that is in the water and i think there is something very special about this place that we can that that is not the, on the on the spectrum here of what you're asking that it's related to like how do we pull these projects off we just don't know that we shouldn't or can't. And we, we there is a tremendous communal spirit in this place that- Jeremy, you can beautiful. actually quit your day job and, 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 and do a comedic relief. I mean, but you know, people think everybody's mean and judgmental here, but you gotta, you gotta like know people. Like we're just very straightforward for the most part in an oversimplified way for Delaware County too. And so it's like, we don't, you know, we don't, we wanna get shit done. You know, we want to do it our way, and we 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 do think believe we can figure out how to do it. And it's still a very inexpensive inexpensive place to live. It's an inexpensive city to like experiment in. There's a there's a there's a dark side to that about the deep poverty rate that is really sad. That we have we have we have a poverty crisis in the city. There's a lot of problems in the city, but it's a very real place to live and a very beautiful place to live. And it is you know I could go on and on about Philly, but I think there's there is something about this place. That the work coming out of it from this whole community of people, this Philadelphia school is is really fun to be a part of for sure. Absolutely, I feel very welcome yeah. uh, meet, meeting you folks, and uh, I appreciate the non-brand mention throughout the wonderful presentation, uh, Jeremy and Oka. But I wanted to make a point real quick of when Steve was talking about uh, the assembly. That's Steve with Holstrom. You mentioned plywood. We don't use plywood in these conversations either from now on. We're thinking about not using the word wood anymore either, Steve. So I just want people to be aware of while we're eliminating brand names, let's not really. talk about natural and organic materials. Um, really, everyone, thank you so much for tonight. This discussion was great. And there's a private chats that go on with many of us. And I know there's 50 of us left here. Those private chats are amazing. And the live chats that went on with some of you during this discussion, for us to sit back and enjoy it, I really want to uh, tell you all how much I appreciate it because it's so incredible. I almost feel like we're sitting at the same table breaking bread. Um, it's amazing the fact that we can joke like that. And it's because of the amount of work that we put forth on these projects that we get to break out and do this. So uh, appreciate all of you for that. Right on, Mark. And I have to say these debates, 
you know, we're joking around, we're having a good time, but there's a really great purpose behind them. We're trying to dig down to the truth of the matter. And as we evolve into better products that have lower carbon footprints, different materials, we need to understand how to vet these things with the tools that we have. So let's start on wood. Let's start on wood fiber. Let's start on whatever we've got uh, yeah. in order to figure it out and get good at these tools so that when the new products come down the line, we can vet them quickly, right? And support yep. them if they do the job. Well said. Uh, let's see, we've got a question up. Shane, you have been so patient and I, I think this is a great question. So if you can unmute, please do. Sure, uh, first of all, again, great presentation and uh, great exchange. I look forward to learning as I continue to, to listen to all of the exchange, but I heard, uh, I think in the presentation, sort of a combination of opportunity and frustration uh, in the discussion of the changing FIA standards. And I guess from the team's perspective, when you were running the different variables uh, or the models for 15 and 18 and 21, did it feel like you were making changes or the adaptations that you designed uh, were, were, were running? Were you, did it feel like you were sort of teaching to the test or that you were doing things that you felt were making material improvements to, to the building uh, for the betterment of the occupants or other reasons. Uh, how did it feel while, while you were doing that? And, and I think for me, the comment on, on the requirement for EV you know, charging where you just happen to be able to meet that uh, and, and therefore you passed, uh, maybe hints at some of how it feels like it, uh, maybe it was perceived at the time, but can you speak to that? I, you know, the, 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 I just feel like I'm holding on loosely to this whole thing. Like I'm, I'm a hundred percent dedicated to this. I live and breathe this shit. I'm like, my heart is in it. And, but I have to hold on loosely because I just, I don't know if we're going to get there to the end with things like we just got lucky with the EV ready thing because we had a garage. Right. So just as an example, uh, I believe we can get there and I'm hoping and we're doing, we're pressing as hard as we can every day. In terms of the the changing um, requirements, I, I feel Elke could speak to that better than me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we just have a very unique uh, example here because it went on for this long, and it happened to have all these like changes within the time frame, right? So typically, you just kind of sign up and you have your requirements, and that what that's what you're meeting. So I think uh, this is a, this was a pretty good learning curve, and um, for me. Yeah, at times, you know, when when changes happen, it's something to learn <laughs> again, right? It's every time something changes, you have to learn, you have to get used to it. And then there's, you know, maybe some something off in the calculator the first round. And, you know, of course, it's it's um, in some way a little bit frustrating. But on the other hand, I feel like all those changes are responses to the market to feedback from people, you know, going through certification to make it more accessible, not easier in general. I don't, I don't think that the, that the certification itself is getting easier. Like, I mean, I hear that here and there, but I, I don't agree with that. I just feel like that the, the goal is, is there. And, um, you know, there's, there's a response to climate, there's re response to, uh, you know, like developers that say, well, it's hard for us to, to put the PV on. Is, is there any kind of certification that we can meet to, to have a goal to push this further? You know that it's that it's possible. So I, I feel like those are all, all good changes in general. And I, I really, really appreciate appreciate that, you know, with just kind of as a, as a response mechanism, basically. And again, I mean, if, if the project, if we signed up a, a month later, we, would, we wouldn't even had to, uh, you know, we didn't have to go to test the 2015. I just did it because we had the opportunity. So we would have started at 2018. And if we didn't run into, um, you know, the developer changing his, his uh, not his mind, but uh, having the challenges with, you know, supply change and, you know, everything getting more expensive, we would have just stick, stuck with 2018 and certified under that, um, that, you know, certification. So I, 
I don't know. I, I think that this was just a unique experience. Um, yeah, that we don't want to repeat, right? I mean, well, I, I learned it's a funny. lot, which I, mean, I had like, to learn, right? Yeah, I, I'm just saying, like, I, I, it, it, you you learn through the toughest moments of your life, and this was the, the fact that it got drawn out and all these changes is is not something like it's not a process. I I necessarily want to say. I think what Ilka and I talked a lot about, just to be really clear, what I'm saying is like. We, a lot of these past files presentations are like, wow, this is, past files is like really hard, by the way, like super duper hard. So it's like super discouraging to have people present like that. It, this was challenging, but I learned so much through this. I'm really thankful for that. So I echo that and honor what you're saying, Elka, but like all of us, and you and I are very passionate about this to say like, it's still, it's possible. You have to be fluid. You have to be iterative. You have to like dance with it. And yeah. next time I can, I just honestly see like, famous last words, but with FIAS Core 2021, especially we're doing a project with the prescriptive and the, uh, well, both paths where you need an energy metal and not. And it's like, it's 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 amazing. I, I honestly do think it makes it easier because there's more fluidity and, and you, you know, there's more room in that system. And I'm really happy about that. There's more, even if it's more stringent, you at least know what you can count on, if that makes sense. Thank you guys. And again, uh, also as a follow-up, I'm not sure what the basis is behind the decision not to use brand names, but as a developer trying to bring Passive House at a pretty large scale um, in the Washington metropolitan area, uh, I come and attend uh, sessions like this to learn as, as everyone's doing. And it's a, obviously a research intensive group. I don't know if it's uh, for legal reasons, if it's because there are sponsors who would be offended. I don't know what the issue is. Uh, but I think that knowing what was used in a building or what a team uh, settled on uh, isn't going to just make it magically appear in somebody else's project, but it's part of the learning experience. So I don't know why that decision was made, but I attend these sessions often because I want to know what's working. And I think a lot of people or, or what is or, or even more importantly, what didn't work uh, or why it didn't work to how to use it differently the next time. So uh, I would just respectfully request that. Uh, perhaps using uh, brand names is uh, reconsidered as just that's what that's what we use. It's not what's best for your project, yeah. but that's what we. I could, I could take that one, Shane. Um, I'll I'll be the one that takes that one on the chin. So some of what you heard tonight uh, was tongue in cheek about not mentioning manufacturers. Yeah. Um, so it's. Uh, it's, it's certainly not our purpose here to uh, endorse manufacturers by any stretch. It's more like, as you heard, the, the, the modeling and, and whatnot that Ilka and Jeremy's team do behind the scenes. So we don't put the manufacturers first. It's more about the planning and whatnot. However, in the comments section, you see Folks like uh, Michael from Bethlehem and Shannon routinely put the links up and the audience fills in a lot of those voids. But all of us, just because we're only here uh, every Wednesday with the accelerator, we're all here to support the products and the people and the systems that you need to put in place. So not mentioning the manufacturers doesn't mean uh, you're, you're in a different click. We're all here and uh, we're happy to meet with you anytime to bring that forward. Okay. Absolutely. Well, I thought I wasn't Shane, allowed to. Shane, we all, well, we all can name names. And so Jeremy, we kind of let you guys suffer a little bit and you suffered so elegantly. Okay. Um, but it, Shane, if you go on the Accelerator website and watch some videos, you'll you'll see products all the time. Um, okay. you know, I just, getting I, it sounded like it was a change or something. Well, I, it's probably me being conservative because they told me it not is. to do it. Yes. And I can't remember what rules are ever in my life. And I'm like, I, yeah. I'm going to get these my friends in trouble. I, I scoured my script okay. so I wasn't naming it. Hit me up. I just put my email in the thing. Any questions you have, I, changes, I just email me and I'm happy to share share That's stuff right. with you. Yeah, Thank because you your again, bar is up project. here, Jeremy. Your bar is up here. And, and in terms of following like, rules, it's like so low. It's bad, so that's why I hang out with Ilka and and legitimate the people. These people legitimize me. It's so nice. I hear you. We're all we're all chasing Ilka. He's like my calm measuring stick to the impulsive need to just go fast and loose on everything. She's so wonderful. I mean, like just the best person. 
I feel like you're kind of stereotyping me as German. I know you, you really did catch that. You didn't take the compliment. You took it as mm -hmm. no. It's a total. You know what? I'm going to blame that on Steve because he did it first. That's right. Ilka's not allowed to freak out. You know, only me. Yeah. yeah. I see how I see what I did there, Ilka, and I publicly apologize. But yeah, Ilka, but... you know, Jeremy might be a punk rocker, but you're the most conservative rebel I've ever known because you mm -hmm. wow. have room to go like three different ways as you aggressively push the envelope, which is oh. just awesome, right? So I'm gonna hand off the last question of the night to the most patient man, John Jensen. Another really guy. Big fan. Great job tonight. Ilka, Jeremy, I uh, really am uh, very happy to see you all doing so well. And Thanks, John. love the project. I mean, it looks like a real achievement. I'll say single family to multifamily. I take either of those before trying to pull a row house off because a big block like that just seems to be difficult. Um, so I was going to ask you something about the limitations on the ductwork of your HVAC system now that you can mention it. Sure. Or, yeah. um, or I had another question if you felt like you had already addressed it. Uh, so you're asking, you, uh, sorry, I was actually trying to pull up the ductwork plan. You, you're asking about the limitations of the ductwork as a general question. Are there any specific limitations that come from using a system that is designed to both ventilate, heat and cool and dehumidify? And you had said you got to cram all the ducts in there. Or something oh, thank in the you. Chat. Yes, so John. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I think um, the challenge. Yes. Thank you. Um, the challenges we had. The military units. I'm a big fan of. They are amazing until they hit their limit, right? Which is, uh, I think, it's a uh, one one ton, roughly one ton heating and cooling. I think, right? That is the limit. Um, and I think that there can be some limits with like the fan motor and how far it can blow air through these 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 ducts to to where you need it to go right so that's yeah the available different. static pressure as well thank you john yeah and so there was some challenges in this project with where we had to locate the two units and then particularly just like an erv when you we're getting much better now in projects where we in in revit not me up but the, the, the stat you know man and jordan and jordan in particular in this one locating it and drawing it and drawing it, drawing the actual ductwork and you're like wow these things overlap each other and a lot of the, the wonderful mechanical engineers JM engineering are just amazing but in a lot of their, their drawings are really good but we kind of had to do a lot of iteration because these ducts were eight inches they were insulated ducts in eight inches that is far larger than an erv at four inches generally and sometimes six that was the biggest challenge because this building height was four stories and we couldn't really get very tall ceiling heights in here to just, usually we would just drop the ceiling one foot. And all of our passive houses now that are like this, we're just saying like, you know, floor to ceiling to framing is hopefully 10 feet. Sometimes it's down to nine. And we're just gonna drop the entire thing one foot. Cause I, I'm just sort of tired of, the, of, of trying to imagine if they're gonna do it the way I want to, right? And you and right. I are working on a project that, that does this and, and thank God we did that cause the ductwork is working out good. but with the Minotaurs as an eight inch thing, it, it is, that is the biggest challenge. Uh, and mm. locating these very large units, they are large units, they do everything, but that means they're bigger and that they need to be close to an outside wall. And that's, that's extra hard, right? For a larger box. And then the third thing is filter changes. One of the units in these houses is going to be a dream to change the filters. It's down in the sort of ground floor lobby space. The other one, not so much. It's in a ceiling cavity where you're gonna to have to like pull down the thing and change the filter. And I can see that being a problem. Um, so we've really subsequently on every project, we go through like a filter change protocol to say, how do you change the filter? Do you have to get up on a ladder? Do you have to do anything? And if you have to do anything that is not just that like person level, it, it is, um, we, we do our best to avoid that. So those are the, those are the three things I can think of. I prefer not to go get a six foot ladder if I don't have to. Yes, or, or a two foot ladder. Uh, most construction deaths happen from falling off of a six foot ladder. True story. Oh. Because you fall, sorry, this, is, this got really dark really quick, but you, it is dangerous. You fall on a six foot ladder, the way that you fall, you, you could break your neck. So I, we don't want, you know, like, I don't want, I don't want my no mom No more six foot ladders. Everybody go to your closets, get yeah. your six foot ladders. Eight footer, four footer. <laughs> Fine. Six, yeah. No way. Twenty-four foot ladders. They're really like careful. But it's these small ladders. Like you think about like when we do affordable housing work, and we're doing a lot with you with the grant. It's, it's been a real pleasure. 
uh, doing that stuff. But like we, you know, you've challenged us on a number of occasions. We've had to really think of things like you don't want to put technology and don't want to be too assumptive about people. I don't want to be ableist here, so don't take it that way. I'm just saying like you don't want to put people in a situation where they have to like it's a pain in the ass to change a filter. And I, as it, as, and that is my responsibility as a designer. I don't want to put that on the MVP engineer. We have to be more direct about that in the future. Yeah, we should be always trying to remove friction from barriers. Any, you know. Anything that we want to happen. But you run out of room in these row houses, as you know, my friend. You run out of room very quickly. So getting the, the mechanical room large enough is like, I mean, it's like a, it ends up being another bedroom in some cases. So, so it, 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 that is the, uh, in a large luxury single family home, got all the room you need in a, in a tall, small building like this. It's challenging, but we made it work. Uh, it was a lot more coordination than I thought, and, and it's, uh, we're excited to see him going. You did it. Very excited for the project. We did Great it. Job. Jordan, Jordan did it. Uh, Jordan worked it out. It's still happening. Yeah. Yeah, Jordan, any, any final thoughts? Jay Mraz? Jordan on the call? Uh, I think, yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. Right. No, you guys got it all. You guys did everything. <laughs> Except for the drawings that you did. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all of the architecture work. <laughs> so guys, no one said it, but Jordan did all the work and Elka and Jim. And Amanda, largely Amanda, who might be on the call, did a lot of the schematic design work. This was kind of a very huge team effort and just huge shout out to my team. Just best people to work with ever. Amanda spearheaded the early stage schematic stuff and then it got handed off to Jordan. I think it was your first job at Right Common. Was it your first project? Yeah, first project and first anything high performance as well. Crushed it, man. Yeah. Well, what an evening. We have pushed the overtime to a whole nother hour, which, you know, we try to stop at 30 minutes, but you guys are just on a roll and it just kept going and going. But um, we do need to wrap it up. See you next week. Check out the podcast. Have a blessed night.